Hi, Gary Zacharias here with the Apologist Bookshelf. I want to look at a little bit older book today called The Soul of Science. It came out in 1994 by Nancy Piercy. And I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, wait a minute, uh, an older book, uh, it's got to be out of date. No, not, not the part I'm reading. Uh, certainly there have been uh, later scientific uh, discoveries that they will not have talked about in this book. But the part I want to look at especially is so strong today. It's uh, dealing with uh, science and Christianity. And the, the book has gotten some amazing reviews. Phil Johnson, the professor of law at uh, UC Berkeley, he says uh, this book shows that the alliance between atheism and science is a temporary aberration. And the fact that Christian theism has played and will continue to play an important role in the growth of scientific understanding. J.P. Moreland said this book would be an excellent text for courses on science and religion, and it should be read by all Christians interested in the relationship between science and their theological commitments. So do you see that connection there between science and uh, Christianity? And they talk about that in the intro to their book. They said that um, we will identify and track some of the more significant philosophical streams of thought since the scientific revolution. And they said uh, back then, you know, in the 19th century, it says it wasn't until the late 19th century, the early 20th century, did Christian faith lose its hold as a shared public commitment, and it retreated. And it's really sad. I've heard other uh, people who studied history talk about that, that Christianity gave up the public square and talked about just knowing internally that Jesus is uh, Lord and, and not making an argument for the truth of Christianity out in the public square. And it's really sad because uh, we've given over uh, to the uh, secularists all of the, the public square and all the um, ability to influence our society. So they said, um, our goal in this book is to describe highlights in the growth of science both before and after this change took place. In other words, at one time, Christianity was a big part of society. And it says references to God in public discourse were common, but it was the late 1800s that Christianity began to lose its uh, part as a public uh, commitment and all. So they said, we want to introduce Christians to a part of our rich intellectual heritage. I like that a lot. It says, we learned that in compar until comparatively recent times, Christians have actually worked out the implications of their faith in all areas of life and scholarship, from philosophy to math to physics to biology. Christian faith has not been a purely private matter. That is so important. We have to gain that public square again. We have to get out and make an argument for the truth of Christianity. If we sit in our little Christian enclaves, um, we can influence each other and strengthen each other and create a wonderful bond, but we're letting society go downhill. So um, I, th I like this book. It's basically introducing readers to people who had these quote-unquote secular accomplishments, but actually those accomplishments came out from a deep commitment to their faith. So let me just take one chapter. It's the very first chapter, and they call it an invented institution, Christianity and the Scientific Revolution. And so science writer Lauren Isley is somebody they start with. And um, he says, you know, Westerners kind of have the idea that there's just going to be continual progress and sort of like as time passes, more knowledge accumulates, kind of like a little acorn becomes an oak tree. And yet this idea of thinking that we call today the scientific method, its emphasis on experiment and mathematical formulation only came out of one culture, Western Europe, and no other. So Isley is saying, you know, science is really not natural to mankind at all. It doesn't just sort of develop. Inquisitiveness about the world is a natural attitude. That's true. People scratch their heads and wonder why certain things happen. But he's far, he said as far as institutional science, it's far more than that. It's an invented cultural institution, he says. And he says, you know, science demands a kind of a unique soil in which to flourish. Well, what is that soil? Now, remember, Isley's not a Christian, I don't think. And it says he somewhat reluctantly says it's the Christian faith. He said, this is a direct quote from Isley, it's the Christian world which, which finally gave birth in a clear, articulate fashion to the experimental method of science itself. I just find that really interesting. People like Carl Sagan will talk about 
the Greeks and their great thinking and all, but as far as the experimental method, as far as the scientific method, they never carried it beyond just thought processes. And so, interesting, if you really want to have modern science, it has to come through Christianity. Christianity provide intellectual presuppositions and moral sanction for the development of modern science. And then they talk about how in the Middle Ages, people today have been talking about the Dark Ages, but that's not true. And it's been rehabilitated in a sense. So I'm going to skip over that. And instead, what I'd like to do is focus on why, why it was that Christianized Europe became the birthplace of modern science and no place else. They said, you know, when you think about it, other cultures like the Chinese and the Arabs actually produced probably a higher level of learning and technology than medieval Europe. But it was Christianized Europe, and not these other cultures are actually may have been more advanced that gave birth to modern science as a systematic self-correcting discipline. Why would that be? And they said, well, there are certainly other uh, factors besides Christian faith. You had trade that grew and commerce and technological adv advances and the founding of scientific institutions like the Royal Society. Let me stop there for just a minute. The Royal Society was actually founded by Christians. So even that could be considered part of Christianity. But they said, you know, it was actually certain scientific investigations got started because there were assumptions about the world. And so that's what I wanted to look at here. What are these assumptions, Christian assumptions that scientists took and ran with and produced modern science? So to begin with, and there, we'll do several of these, to begin with, the Bible teaches that nature is real. Now, that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Well, duh. But it says, think about this. Many belief systems regard nature as unreal, especially Eastern religions, you know, pantheism and things like that. It's just an appearance of the one. Hinduism says, you know, the everyday world, everything you look at out there, the material world, it's maya. It's an illusion. So if that's their attitude, if it's an illusion, why would you study it? But the Christian doctrine, though, of creation teaches these objects are not just appearances of the infinite. God made them. They're real. They're out there. You can bump your head against them. So number one, nature's real. Here's another assumption that led to science. Number two, not, not only is nature real, nature is good. A society has to be persuaded that it's of value. Nature's of value and that therefore it'd be worthy of study. And the Greeks, as they mention, lack this conviction says the ancient world often saw the material world as evil and disorderly and they objected to that and they <clears throat> manual labor was no good and philosophers would sit around and think great thoughts and so the Greeks really did not develop empirical science that you had to have hands-on observation and they didn't think that was worth it they they thought it was kind of low to do that but the early church defended a high view of the material world Material things were to be used for the glory of God and for the good of men. And so as a result, it was, uh, it was, there was no put down of manual labor. There was no slave class to do that work. Craftsmen were respected. There was dignity of work that came big in the Reformation. So first of all, assumption one was nature's real. So you could get out and examine it. It's really there. Number two, nature is good. Work is good. It's perfectly all right to get out and dig around in the world. Number three, nature is not God. Here's another assumption. In biblical teaching, nature is good, but it's not a God. It's a creature. The Bible says you don't deify creation. And you compare that, they said, with pagan religions. They were animistic or pantheistic, and they treated the natural world either, either as an abode of the divine, you know, they lived in it, or an emanation of God's own essence. So you don't dig apart a log or uh, do anything to animals or anything like that. If the divine is there, you leave it alone. But nature's not God, according to Christianity. God doesn't inhabit a, the world the way a dryad inhabits a tree. He's not a personalization of natural forces. I mean, you take a look. They said at something like Genesis 1. It rejects any status, religious status, given to the sun, the moon, or the stars. They're not divine. They're light bearers. They're placed in the sky to serve God. So natural phenomena are not seen as deity. They're not objects of awe and reverence and to keep your hands off. They're creations of God. 
their place in the world, to serve his purposes, contribute to human welfare. So that was a huge thing that happened for science to start. You had to de-deify nature, as they say. So the monotheism of the Bible got rid of gods of nature and a freed people to enjoy and investigate without fear. Well, here comes another reason. So, so far we've done three. Nature is real. Nature is good. Nature is not God. And nature is orderly. Number four, this is a rational God who created an orderly world. And you think about paganism. They had all sorts of gods, but Christianity said there's one. So you had a unified, coherent universe as a result. Uh, They quote a theologian who says, Man did not face a world full of ambiguous and capricious gods who are alive in the objects of the natural world. Just one God. They, in a sense, they got rid of the sacred in nature, and so you could actually examine it, and it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be chaotic. So it says, not only did the order of nature rest on the existence of one God, but on the character of that God. The God is trustworthy in the Bible; He's dependable. So uh, they give you an example of Copernicus. He said. He knew the universe was wrought for us by a supremely good and orderly creator. Notice that, orderly creator. All right, here's another thing, uh, another uh, presupposition as scientists began to look out in the world. Nature has laws. So they believed there was an order to the universe, and therefore they thought there were natural laws. So they compare that with people in pagan cultures. They would see nature as alive, and it was mysterious, and probably wouldn't have lawful and intelligent laws that you could figure out. But the biblical God is a divine legislator. He governs nature by decrees that he set down in the beginning. So the early scientists did not argue that the world was ordered and therefore that it had to be a rational God. They started the other way around. They said there was a rational God first, and therefore, since they believed that, that the world had to be lawfully ordered. So it's the whole conviction that nature is intelligible came from biblical principles. All right, here's another thing, another uh, presupposition they had. Nature can be described precisely. Not only is nature lawful, but you could state some of these uh, things going on out there in mathematical formulas. Genesis shows us a, a workman. God's a workman, completely in charge. So it's precisely the way God wants it to be when he creates the world. That was alien to many others. Uh, you know, for example, in the Greeks, there's a, the crea- in Plato, Plato, for example, his creation myth, the creator was an inferior deity who didn't create from nothing. He just put some ideas into reason, reasonless matter and even did that imperfectly. Matter was stubborn stuff. It could resist the rational structure. So as a result, the Greeks had uh, kind of an idea of imprecision in nature, kind of a fuzziness, they said, at the edges. Not so for Christianity. In their idea of creation ex nihilo, God creating out of nothing, means there's no pre-existing substance that has its own properties that somehow limit what God can do. All right, let's come up with uh, number seven here, another assumption of scientists as they began to look out in the world. So can we do a quick uh, background here? So uh, number one, nature is real. Number two, nature is good. Nature is not God. Nature is orderly. That was number four. Number five, nature has laws. Number six, you can describe nature in some mathematical formulas, which is a pretty optimistic kind of thing. Here's number seven. Nature can be understood by humans. We can actually understand and discover the order that goes out there. Why? Because humanity was created in the image of God. Now, they take the Chinese as another example here. It said they had no belief in an intelligible order in nature, nor in the human ability to decode it. There was no confidence that humans could understand this stuff. But Christians, Christian scientists said basically that we would be capable to think God's thoughts after him. The natural world is, is comprehensible to us because the, the person, the uh, being that created it and ordered it is reflected in our own reasoning. Isn't that uh, good to know? Think about how optimistic that would make us feel to say we can get out there and we can understand because we've been made in the image of God. God created humans with powers of observation and reasoning necessary to be able to gain knowledge about the natural world. So those are the uh, seven that I thought were really powerful assumptions that were made 
for people a long time ago who got out there with optimism and were able to do modern science, create modern science. So one more time, number one, nature's real. Nature is good. These are all Christian assumptions that led to science. Three, nature's not God. Four, nature is orderly. It's not chaotic out there. Number five, nature has laws. Number six, we can use math. Nature can be described precisely. Number seven, nature can be understood by humans. We can actually understand it. We have the optimism because of what God did to us. He created us to be in his image. We would have our reasoning powers. Okay, well, that's the book, The Soul of Science. And like I said, that won't go out of date. The book is, like I said, older, 1994. But things like the, the background of science, uh, that does not change. And so, so this book, in the words of a lecturer in the University of Oxford, this book, it says, should be required reading for all thinking Christians and all practicing scientists. Um, the idea that modern science flowered because of, not in spite of, but in co- because of the Judeo-Christian worldview. All right, well, thanks, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this one, and let's do another podcast soon.